move to enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining as an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining of the public body and the chair so declares. And uh, we'll be discussing an absolutely clerical union and also conduct strategy in preparation for negotiations with a non-union personnel, namely the town administrator. And we will return to the session on completion of our executive session. Second. All right, we will read the uh, governor's script for open meetings. As a preliminary matter, I am Chris Silva, the chair of the maintenance select board. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda, our president can and can hear me. So the only person that is on the agenda is Greg Johnson. Greg, can you hear us? He by wave. Yep. Yep. Says he can hear us. Okay. And this open meeting of the Maynard Select Board is being conducted via Zoom and live. Speakers on the agenda will be participating remotely, and the chair may allow for the public to provide comments. The select board would like to hear public comments, and if there is further action that is required by the board, the chair will add the matter as appropriate to a forthcoming agenda. Depending on the comment, the board may, if we are able within the confines of the open meeting law, respond with information as opposed to needing to deliberate on the matter. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast to individual attendees unless otherwise required by law. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you, so take care not to screen share your computer as anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the documents for this evening's meeting are on board docs, except for our executive session documents. And um, so please follow along there unless otherwise noted. We are now going to turn to the first item on the agenda, but before we do so, Permit me to cover some ground rules for the effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any further comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name and address before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourselves. For items with public comments, after the members have spoken, the chair may afford public comments as follows. We will first ask the members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. And once the chair has a list of all public commentators, we will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Public comment for public hearings will only be accepted in person per the open meeting law. And we are now going to go to the next agenda on the item on our agenda, the next item, which will be the Pledge of Allegiance. But before we do, I'd like to welcome our new member, Lindsay McConkie, to the board. She might be the first member in a long time to actually start on July 1st. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So welcome. Thank and you. we all look forward to having you be a part of our group. So we'll, with that, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have any public comments this evening in the room? All right. Do we have any public comments online this evening? Okay. No more public comments. All right. All right. Um, right into the next item, which is the reorganization of the select board, which is an annual event in the first meeting of July. And um, there are two motions to be made and then some housekeeping. So um would anybody like to make a motion under the first category which is the naming of the chair for the next year uh i would like to make a motion to nominate jess swanberg um, as chair of the select board for a term of july 1st 2024 through june 30th 2025 i'll second that motion um okay is there any comment Questions? 
I accept. Okay. Does anybody have anyone else they'd like to nominate under the officer chair? Okay. Um, all those in favor of Jeff Swamberman become the chairman of the board from July 1st to June 30th of 2025. Raise your hand. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. And thank everybody for the past year. Um, as chair, all your help in getting to where we are today from last year's first day. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Um, would anybody like to make a motion as to the clerk? Yeah, I'll motion uh, to nominate select board member uh, Mike Stevens as clerk for the select board for the term July 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. Second. Any conversation, argument, debate? Oh, show of hands. <laughs> Mike's been doing a great job. Mike's been into the best. Thank you. I, uh, Thank you. I appreciate you taking it on. Thank All you. right. So you want to in here? You want what do you want to do? Uh, we can we can today and uh, you want me to do this? Yeah, you, you want, want to run through the rest of the meeting? Okay, yeah, I'll it's gonna be quick. All right. Um so we have liaisons and and it's on here, it's listed as a topic. Um, I don't know if, if do you do we want to go through them tonight? Do you guys ever want to kind of take a look at them? We we do them at the next meeting, just kind of assign them at the next meeting. If anybody has anything that uh, kind of piques their interest or um, gets them, you know, something that they're doing now that they might want to get away from, and you know, uh, if we're if we're looking at the ones that we've got assigned to us now, and then we take Justine's and we assign them over to Lindsay uh, for the time being, at least. Um, it's probably the easiest way to do it and then have a discussion if we want to uh, adjust. The, the one that yeah. uh, Lindsay should be aware of uh, is the MAPC issue, which requires uh, presumably meetings uh, you know, outside um, off campus, if you want to call it. So there, is, there is some off campus stuff. It's usually once, once, once or twice a month. Um, and it's, you know, it's usually in Lincoln or Concord or what any, you know, some of the surrounding towns that are, um, on MAPC with us, um, they, it, Bill Nemser is also involved. He's the second person from Maine on the MAPC and he has been a board member or a director. He's very, very involved with the MAPC. So if there's ever anything that anyone that's in that position can't do, Bill is always there to pick up the slack and, you know, follow up with an email as to what went on. So that's that's that one. But so if you want, you know, if you want to um accept those those one two, she has six. Yeah. And then take so take a look at them, and then we'll sure. We'll, 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 we'll rediscuss like. it the next sure. time, and just have a conversation. So no, I mean, I think this is fine. I does anybody have one they don't want to be part of anymore, or continue on this? Nothing in particular. If there's anything that I'm particularly interested in. Okay. Well, capital planning is really the thing I was most interested in, and that was Justine. So that's that's fine. That's it. All right. It's good. All right. So goal setting. We have a suggested um, goal setting meeting for um, twenty twenty five and beyond. Um. With a proposed date. Yeah, did you? July twenty third. No, that's no. What is? Great way to. I I know I saw it. Yeah, it it's. I put it in the next item because it's relative to all your. Okay. Um, Scheduled yeah. for July twenty third on here. Yeah, that was just a penciled in date. I just was trying to help out with sh throwing a you know throwing a calendar date out there. Okay. It's all right. Um, does anybody, well, does anybody have a conflict with July 23rd that they know as of this, this time? I, I, the other question I guess I'll ask because we, we you know, does anybody have a, at, at that date, is, there, is it beneficial, more beneficial to anybody or a majority of us to do it um, remotely? Um, on that day, 
I think for a person for that particular meeting, yeah. it's been a goal setting to have that. Yes. Yeah. And then location is yeah. the other question. Great. We said a few locations. Um, yeah, Mill and Main, Open Table, Sanctuary, COA, Library. We have done at the COA in the past. That's kind How of about the fire yeah. station. Yeah. Yeah, you can do it there too. Okay. Can we try the fire station on the 23rd? Sure. That works for me. Okay. Um, we have it listed as 6 30. Is everybody okay with 6 30 on the 23rd? I can do that. Yeah. All right. So Great, <laughs> these, these guys are going to be all the time. And Becky's not here either. So, all right. So, 6 six thirty on um, the 23rd at the fire station. Cool. All right. Um, and then we have below that the next item is to set the meeting dates for fiscal year 2025. And there is a motion for that. Um, we would like to make a motion for that. Mr. Chair, if I could give a quick context. So yeah. um, Greg Wilson did a great job putting putting this together. He looks at the first and third Tuesdays of the month, and then he also tries to catch any other special. Um, it's, you know, it's never perfect, but, you know, like, it would, you know, I, I appreciate Greg Wilson's attempts to try to get um, all the all the regular meeting schedules in there. Um, but I also noted some other, you know, more, uh, um, a proc, you know, closer meeting dates that are proposed as well. Like, for, for example, I've been trying to figure out when is the best time to have that follow up quad meeting that we had the other day at the training at the um, fire station. And um, that's a little tricky because uh, the town clerk points out that, you know, in order to have it on the ballot measure for the state um, election, then we need to have a decision made um, by August 6th, I think. So that kind of messed up my expe expected timeline, but I, I have I have a proposed um, a proposed meeting in there, which I can see doesn't quite capture uh, Greg's Greg's proposal. Um, so if you look at the board docs, it says um, July 30th, I put under the public content um, in my message to the board proposed joint meeting, because if it was after August 6th, then it would miss the deadline to be on the state's ballot. And that and the, the consequence of that would be um, the town would have to put any debt exclusion or other any sort of measures on it on a pilot on a, on a, our own election outside of the state's um, ballot. And it's just more cost effective and efficient if you if you try to capture all the votes you need on a pre-scheduled election like the state ballot. Okay. Otherwise, most of the dates should be just the first and third Tuesdays of the month. All right, just so just so that I'm I'm looking I'm reading it and I understand. So the the state ballot is November 5th. That yep. would have to be done by the, the August 6th. Yep. Our special town meeting, have we scheduled that or just started part of the process of scheduling that? Is this already scheduled or we see the board is not the board has not taken formal like official action. Right. That's just but the we're, that, we're aiming at October seventh. Yep. So so in essence. The decision to be made October August sixth for the November fifth ballot, just placing a placeholder on that ballot. Is that what that's, that's going to do? Because we that, won't yeah, know what right. we're going to have until until November, October seventh. Well, yes and no. So um, I asked that question of the clerk's office to, to ask the Secretary of State's office who regulates um, elections, and I said, like, what if what if the select board said on August sixth, like, hey, we are thinking about having something on the state ballot. And then two days later, the board decided they changed their minds and we don't want anything on the November 5th. Or maybe, you know, we have a special uh, special town meeting in October and it doesn't pass. And so we decide not to have anything on the November. It's too late by that point. The state says once you've once you've given them notice by August 6th that you want something on the state's ballot, it's on the state's bad ballot. OK. All right. We really haven't given ourselves. Um anywhere near enough time to have a vigorous, reasonable discussion about priorities. 
because if assuming that the schools move forward, this board uh, has not had any discussion other than commentary from various members about priorities and whether or not we even support a ballot initiative for a school proposed initiative, let alone uh, a senior proposed initiative. Or a DPW proposed initiative. Or a DPW proposed initiative. We don't have the time for that, given that we're now talking six weeks between today and the date that uh, of July 30th, when we have the quad board, which is three, by uh, what, that's 29 days away. And then August 6th, we're not doing our, we're not doing the residents or the voters fair justice by not having that discussion. But the fact of the matter is, those are the those are timelines that are set. I understand. If we feel as though we're not in a position to make that type of decision, we don't have to. I think we're in that position now. We're not prepared. But if we're if we find ourselves unprepared, we we don't have to take those steps. Those are the dates of those dates are if we decide to take those steps. If we don't feel we're adequately prepared to take those steps, we just don't take them. I, just, I don't think that everybody in the world is going to be happy about it, but if we are not ready to make the step, we're not going to make the step, I don't think. So I think the conversation around the senior release is relatively new after reflective information. I don't, I don't, I think that would be too accelerated for a full town meeting at this point. Um, did a DPW grad, we were just looking at his ability study for the bleachers. This is something that they were pushing for spring meeting and were nearing completion and then decided they needed more time and have done a lot of the extra. But that, the, that goes to the issue of priorities because if we, if we move forward and ask the voters or the residents, the taxpayers to approve a, um, an, an override for bleachers, $3.5 million, whatever it might be. And then we propose that in October, we're gonna come back and ask for another X number of millions of dollars. I mean, that's not fair. But it's, it's just not fair. I, I agree it's not fair, but all we're doing right now is setting the schedule. We're just setting the schedule. If we, if we don't have the information or we don't have what we need to make those decisions, we can alter. We can alter our schedule. We just can't alter the November fifth state election date and the August sixth. Oh, I, I got to say that. So I, I think, but I think the, the the point that I'm trying to make yes. is, let's just be honest. We're not prepared to go forward for July thirtieth or August sixth to say that this is our priority as a community. And so, therefore, you're not ready to go forward with bleachers for the fall. That's period. correct. That's what you're saying. That's correct. Because I think that there are other issues that we need to discuss about how to go about planning for other issues that I believe are more important to the community than bleachers. But would it make sense? So that that's the purpose of the discussion, I believe, on July 30th. So you don't feel comfortable having that discussion on July 30th and then say, you know, the next day you say, well, oh, no, I, I feel uncomfortable. That's fine. Forward. That's fine. But but we would then be leaving ourselves a week and a day. I don't know how many, 31 or 30 or 31 days. <laughs> There's a song, I'll sing you this song. Because <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's Tuesday. But if we would be given ourselves leaving a week and a day, but if the answer is no, because you don't feel prepared, does it matter that it's just it a week and a day? It does. I'm not saying not to have a meeting on the 30th. My this. issue is more on, we need to be prepared now to basically say, oh. it really doesn't look good for August 6th. You know, your point's well taken, David. Absolutely well taken. But I think we just set the schedule and we we work as best as we can to get to those dates and see where we are on those dates. And if, you know, to Lindsay's point, if we're not ready at that point, we vote no, we don't take a vote. That's all. I mean, I, we, you know, we're just setting the schedule. We're not, we're not committing us to anything or the town or you know, of a town meeting, we're not setting any, we're making no commitment other than these are the dates that we'll likely meet to discuss these things. Greg, if we were to ask you on the 6th of August to prepare whatever text is needed to move forward with the bleachers for fall town meeting, 
would you be able to do that or would you need some time no i i can do that i no i that's yeah that, that's what? that's not that complicated um a debt exclusion vote both for town meeting and for the election we've done multiple times already and, a lot, and just in, even in my tenure so that's that itself is not i guess the the detail is the the amount like the the how much are we actually asking but um if you recall it's 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 very similar legislative action at town meeting and the and the ballot but it's a little different one is actually appropriating and the other one is just asking to borrow so it is like asking to go above the the set tax rate but either way, um, I think this is a good, I think these are all good points. Um, my my recommendation would be if the if the board is moving in this direction of approving that proposed set of scheduled dates, um, I would amend the August 8th joint meeting to July 30th. Because what, what you see on board docs is that's, a, we can change that next meeting. I'm looking at July 30th as the date. So I, I mean, just the material. The material that's in board docs has August 8th. So I, I'm yeah. just saying it would be July 30th. There's two different documents and they don't have yep. the same information. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I was confused. Yeah, 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 this, this document? That's, that's not also the same board as the, the, it's not the same board docs. docs. Yeah, so they just don't align. Greg and Greg have to get together and fix it. <laughs> I know. See, we leave each other for a couple days and then we lose our mind meld. <laughs> yes. All right. So, um, well, I guess, would anyone like to make a motion to approve this uh, based on the combined schedules? Well, are we proposing a meeting on August 8th or August 30th? Uh, June, July 30th, so July 30th, I think. July 30th and August 6th. July 30th and August 6th, July 30th for the this proposed joint meeting. In case anybody wants to know who will be here six Tuesdays in a row, but okay. Um, anyways, all right, so yeah, we'll use the dates on the um agenda, which is July 23rd, July 24th is a sub budget subcommittee, then July 30th for a proposed joint meeting of the quad boards, and August 6th is our regular meeting, and then the rest falls in line. Would that quad board meeting be 6 30 like it was the last time? Yeah, <clears throat> if what information do you feel you would need to move? forward with leachers hypothetically oh, i i don't think it's a priority okay that's different than i don't have enough information yeah. for the conversation yeah you don't i think it's it. very simple okay. i don't think it's i don't think it's i think we have too many issues that are going to require us for uh to ask the voters for uh an increased tax rate beyond the typical two and a half that we have to talk about what our priority is and the two issues that i think need to be talked about the one that we had the discussion with on this past weekend with residents um, sort of offline uh, is the senior issue for a proposed long-term or short-term plan for seniors or bleachers. Both are going to require an override. We can't do both. I just think we have to be honest. And if we don't go for bleachers at Fault Henry, or you don't think they're a priority for the town at this point or in, in the next say, few years, you propose continuing or to build in the rental fees for the current bleachers into the current yeah, budget? Yeah, probably that would be what we would have to do. I think that would be part of the discussion as we go forward, but uh, but not, I, I don't think it's the priority. That's just my opinion. I think we have to choose we have to choose a priority for the community, and it's not bleachers in my eyes. That and that's a more detailed discussion than it yeah, is but intended it is. July 30th. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I think I would hope that that's the discussion we do have on July 30th. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. I yeah. That's the discussion we need to have. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So, all right. I move to approve the select board FY25 schedule of meetings as presented. Okay. All right. Would anyone like a second then? Second. With July 30th is the proposed joint budget meeting. Um, all right, any discussion? Any more discussion? <laughs> all those in favor. All right. So that's the schedule. Um, the two Gregs will finish the schedule up and get it out to us. Next up is number five on the agenda, and that's use of town property. Um would anyone like to make a motion for this one? 
Shakespeare I'll, in the Park. I'll move to approve the use of Memorial Park by the Mayor of Cultural Council Cultural District Committee for Shakespeare in the Park on Saturday and Sunday, August 3rd and 4th, 2024, from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m., contingent upon adherence to all federal, state, and local public health and safety guidance authorizing the use of temporal signatures. Approved. Second. All right. Um, I wasn't well. Oh. Does anybody have any questions? Armand is here. So, does anyone have any questions from Armand or any concerns that they want to voice with Armand? Or Armand, can you just give us a brief description of what we're uh, participating in seeing? Well, this is our first one, obviously. First of all, welcome. Thank you. Um, this is our first one we're trying it out and see how that's going to work out. We got the Congress players um, putting it on. So they're already in our experience. They've done it in the Congress, they've done it in Newton. Um, so they um, are very much enthused about who they're made. And we do their meeting from five to seven, but we need to three to eight to set up and you know break down and things like that. And anything that way. So basically, you know, we don't want any closures, we don't need any closures of the streets or anything like that. We're just basically all in the park. Do they perform a show or what? Yeah. It's like a Shakespeare yeah. performance. They're going to be doing a little, an array of different types of plays, so it's not going to be one specific play. So it's more, more or less like an introduction of a different Shakespeare. Yeah, but I guess it's it's it's, it's a play. Yeah. But it's is it pieces of different different? All right, right. So it's like a you know snippets. Snippets. What do you call it when you do that? What do you call it when you're doing the song? Medley. Medley. medley, there medley. you go. Yeah, it's a medley. A medley of, a medley of Shakespeare. Shakespeare medley. With this. But it's, it's not King Lear or whatever. No, no. Okay. Maybe next year if this works out and it's successful, they'll pick one play. Do you guys, do you guys anticipate having like somebody selling refreshments or anything like that? No. No, no, no. Okay. All right. It's a very simple one. It's a Okay. They bring their own pen too, so kind of helpful. Okay. So presumably we have to practice our uh, eloquent language. Absolutely. Yeah, that's well, right. you should be familiar. Well, you should be very easy. You know, you don't have the accent. <laughs> Just as I waste time, so does time waste me. There you go. Right. Everything at Shakespeare at these meetings are we to do. This is like Shakespeare. <laughs> Justine's going to be jealous. She's missing it. <laughs> All right. Um, so on that note, um, any other questions for Armin? Any other comments? All those in favor of Shakespeare in the Park. Thank you, Thank you very much. You. Look forward to it. Yes. yes. All right. We have um, number six is some appointments to some, some board appointments. Yep, I'll move to reappoint board and committee members terms to expire June 30th, 2027, as provided, authorizing use of digital signatures if approved. Second. Any comments on the three appointments? Three year appointments. Okay. All uh, those in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just sorry. a minor one. I'm just uh, curious if anybody knows how to pronounce uh, the first person, Paige, how we pronounce that last name. I was kind of glad. I was kind of had an emotion it was covered. Page is a big guy. Thank you. You got it right. Okay. And what I, I guess my question would be uh, why do we need to have a, a, a representation approved by the board for the scholarship committee? That's how the uh, that's how the committee was formed um, by the warrant article. Okay. It has oh. it has it has like uh so when the I can't remember what year Greg Wilson might know off the top of his head, but but what it we uh, if you follow the Warren article, it should outline uh, how the money is spent and who who authorizes the money being spent, et cetera. Oh, and it, it, it's it, town because we're town, we've got some town money that's being uh, distributed out there for the for the town related scholarships. Is that why? I, yeah, I believe. I mean, it's been a long time since I I researched yeah. the, the article. Greg, d does that sound familiar? Uh. Honestly, I'm not positive because they um, they just showed up in the the schedule of they need to be reappointed. Yeah. I believe that they were first appointed. I think it was three years ago before I got here. Um, but that's really all the information. I'll look it up, but I'm pretty sure it was it's related to its formation in the first place. Okay. All right. 
Any other questions regarding those three appointments? All those in favor? Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Justin, would you like to go on the contract for Stantec with us? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome, Lindsay. Congratulations. Thank you. It's not equal to the room. Good. Good. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, Justin Marco, Public Works Director. In front of you today is the long awaited uh, initiation of phase two of our four phase water capacity improvement process. Um, this consulting contract incorporates actually three major tasks under one. We were able to secure um, earmark funding with the help of Kate Hogan um, as part of an artifact and one development process for $400,000 to move our um, planning processes forward. The three major pillars of this contract consists of the finalization of a treatability and capacity improvement plan that incorporates, um, for those of you you may not know what others say quite often. Our three water treatment plants are interconnected, meaning they feed a system together. So we work in unison with a living organism. Whenever we do one to one, we have to review what its cause and effects are to the end, ultimately the distribution of it. Uh, so we have some new MCLs, uh, minimum contamination level requirements that are coming down the pipe. Well, we heard there's all of the news, you could be talked about it quite often such as PFAS, and those levels are about to be adopted by NASDAQ. Right now, the EPA limits are proposed. They are not finalized in regards to how NASDAQ can digest those and then make them low. So as of right now, NASDAQ is reviewing the EPA limits. They cannot make them higher. They can make them lower, but those implementation processes haven't hit us yet, but they will be hit. So as part of our capacity improvement program, we also have to look at treatability as we put on new sources, raw water differs no matter where you go. Surface water, or well sources, whatever we look for as part of our phase two, which is Rockland, which will be well sources. We have to look at the treatability aspect as well when we incorporate what that um, overall schematic design and design development would be for the finalized phase two process. Number two is during our four phase improvement plan, as you know, plans are implemented and then variables change throughout, whether it's environment, policy, et cetera. When we first um, introduced our four phase plan, MWRA was not an option. During that process, MWRA has made themselves potentially available. So when they say potentially available, as Mike Isley is on for a little while, they have included the Metro West region region, which includes Maynard in their feasibility study for their excess water capacity. It has also recently come to light that the current house bill for uh, the state of Massachusetts has included money for MWRA expansion, but it's not incorporated in the West region. It has incorporated the North and South. Now, at first pass, you would say, oh, no, I'm not us. I will say that I am also disappointed, but I'm also encouraged because this is the first time the Commonwealth in over 20 years is investing in MWRA expansions, um, which then holds true to the fact of our legislative bodies fighting hard for us to be included in a future bond bill as well. But with that being said, the next phase of our uh, collaboration approach is every individual community is doing their own feasibility study to weigh the MWRA option versus their current option, meaning their in-house services. For us to move any process forward and to involve the town with you know a real hard analytical view, we have to look at our long-term vision and come up with cost estimates versus the cost it would be for MWA, whether it's full MWA submission, partial submission, et cetera. So that is phase one of MWA. It also incorporates our master plan as required in SDP. And number three is actually the most important, which is the beginning exploration of future well sources i.e. Rockland and OMR. So some of you remember that at OMR or Omar Road Treatment Location, we actually were able to preliminarily find a well source there with previous grant funding that was identified only for OMR with the potential of a half a million to a million gallon well source there. Rockland now, which is phase two in our process, we are aware of a piloted well source that was part of the online proposal. Yeah. We also have acquired a significant amount of land in that area through Oxcom 
and or town purchase that has expanded the original scope of what Rockham was explored at. There is a significant amount of land that was unexplored as part of the original process. And as you may not know, OMR and well 4A sit in the Conquer River Basin, which is a stress basin. Rockland is not. Rockland is a situation that also has really reduced defense levels compared to OMR and well 4A's treatment locations. Rockland Ave was identified for our phase two because of its availability of exploration sources, its natural water reduction of PFAS, and it is our most, well, well, Ford's treatment plant is now our most sophisticated and modified, but Rockland Ave is our workforce, and it actually has excess treatment capacity when we lost the well source there. So it is our most efficient and effective means mm -hmm. to capture water in a shorter amount of time. The reason that part of this includes OMR's uh, exploration is because as we plan long-term CIPs, even though the town is moving towards a five-year window, in the DPW, we plan for 25, 50 years. And in order for me to make sure that we continue to um, entertain our four-phase approach, you may have seen Bob McCarthy in our news, um, newsletters that indicated that OMR our original phase three has a 3A, which is MWR. We need to make sure that we provide enough guidance that if our plan is appropriate, it may change. And phase three may be MWA expansion. Phase four may not exist. Phase three may still be OMR with phase four being MWA. I can tell you right now, even though it says that we're including White's Pond, which we are, it's PFAS levels are 44.5. Not treat that. That uh, that acid is pretty much a one six. Um, but as we move through this process, the reason it refers to the White's Pond treatment is that as a treatment study that provided us our original basis, and a lot of that comes with the assumptions of what our annual historic use patterns are. And I know that was a lot to digest, but let's just think about it as this way: this is. The town of Nader moving forward with our phase two water capacity improvement process on a funding mechanism provided by the state and not on our residents and our customers. Any questions? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's directly related to the approval of this particular post, but given the recent developments relative to the MWRA issue, um, what is the realistic uh, possibility that we're even going to have an opportunity to jump in to MWRA, given that they apparently start they focused on the North Shore region and ignored the Metro West region. And so what is short answer is all I need. I don't yeah. need the definitive response, but what is the realistic opportunity that we're even going to be in that mix? Or should we start again? prioritizing and saying, hey, MWRA is not going to be it. That's so David, to your point, that's why we're focusing still on our original plan with incorporation of MWRA. I would be disheartened <clears throat> if I saw no expansion funded to the state. <laughs> I'm highly encouraged that the state is even entertaining the fact that they are going to fund an expansion of MWRA. Um, it was discouraging when we went through the process with MWA to find out that MWA was not going to fund any of the expansion. It was made very clear. They will not fund any of their expansion. Their customers and their board made it very clear that their current customer base was not funding an expansion program. As part of that, that's why I encouraged yourselves, many stakeholders within this community, including our collaborative approach. We were, were with a lot of other communities in Metro West to really push your legislative bodies. You know, Kate Hogan's office is well aware of this. Jane Eldridge's office is well aware of this. That House bill is only in the House. It's not over yet. Right now is a conversation with Jane Eldridge. It's going to go through Senate. And I don't see why there shouldn't be a conversation of the importance of Metro West versus North and South Shore. But to your point, David, I will say this. I know Mike, I, we kind of included Mike in the process but you have to understand the North Shore and the South Shore was a process that was led by local house representatives and the Metro West was led by DPW groups. 
there is a harder foot from House Representatives in those two regions than there was Metro West. As you also heard, the 495 partnership that dealt with Jason Friedrichs, whether it's here in Marlboro, Metro West's overall planning has been highly focused on transportation, and they, for some reason, have not been highly focused on water infrastructure. And it's because, to your point with Jason, the Metro West region, 495, has a significant amount of communities already tied in them to Maryland. But Maynard, as we always do, kind of gets left out of that circle. So Marlboro, Shrewsbury, you name it, most of the 495 major communities are already tied in them to Maryland. We're kind of on an island. If you remember the feasibility study, we have one town in our way, it's Sudbury, it's water rich. So there's some complexities to that, but it's not really hitting us. Um, I did have a discussion with Kate Hogan. She asked how she, how she could help after I had Greg send out the email to the board of, of understanding where we're at. But I really think Jamie Eldridge is the key to at least having the conversation because it does need to pass through something. And if not now, the understanding of the importance of it to me, I will tell you, my colleagues and most of the other communities that are looking for this conquered, uh, Lexington, Lincoln, a lot of other of our colleagues are doing the same thing. It's time to hit your center, make sure they at least are aware of it. Mm -hmm. But I am encouraged that this bill is even gonna, even gonna come to fruition for any end of career expansion. So we are incorporating it where it falls in our overall plan is either three, three A or four. And we still have due diligence to do to make sure that one, if it's available, it's the right decision for Maynard. And that's the due diligence we'll start with our phase three approach here. And as we already understand the feasibility study, it's a $1.6 billion project for Metro West expansion. That's not coming from back in. There's no way we can afford it. All of our communities, the town administrators that are participating managers, there's no way they can afford them. They we need state support, which is why there's a bond bill for North and South Shore, the same, same approach. So I think we need to keep the keep the pressure on a local legislature. Why, why is Sudbury as opposed to that Hudson Stowe off? I know we talked about that several months ago. Yeah, Stowe doesn't have a distribution. So a lot of it is is really, and a lot of it is also dictated by MWA's current infrastructure. So they have a major aquifer that's in Boston, which goes through Marlboro, right on the skirt of Sudbury, Wayland, and that's where they want to tag off of. Because like anything else, their capacity, yes, they have an expansive amount of water and the ability to produce it. But they don't, as part of the 1.6 billion, they also explored the most efficient and effective piping system. So the size of their aquifer is capable of handling that excess demand. It's the piping from aquifer to us and the other communities. It still has no infrastructure whatsoever. Yeah, there's no infrastructure. Yeah. We have what we could refer to, and if you read the study enough, it's referred to as wheeling water. Wheeling water is a grid. We have a grid, a distribution network within the ground in Maynard, um, as do a lot of our neighboring communities, where they pump water, like back feeding it through your veins and produce it that way. But that's a very hard process to do. And a lot of our piping that's already in the ground versus our other communities don't match up. And that's a pressure issue. So we have to provide a significant amount of pressure. So that was explored as part of the delivery process of wheeling water in situations like that. But um, it was determined to be on these. Can I ask a question on the just on the sequencing of the phases? Mm -hmm. So, as I recall from capital planning, the OMR site water treatment plant requires yes. like an eighty something million dollar Correct. treatment. So, mm -hmm. this is to explore whether or not OMR would be feasible instead of MWRA. Is that correct? That's one part. It's one part of it. So, just so you also know, OMR is currently an active site. Meaning it's not shut down. We okay. produce really bad water. And anybody that lives in the neighborhoods know that purple water comes out of that. Okay. And that's because the plant's not designed to handle the raw water that is currently there. But we actually rely on that plant to provide almost 33% of our water. But if it does need a replacement for 80 something million dollars, we obviously wouldn't be able to afford that without an override. And so how does the how does the sequencing and like the, the cadence of timing work out if we get to a point where we do have to go to the town to ask for an override to cover the cost of that replacement, but also we're still waiting for MWRA? Are we way far out from that? Are we years from having to? We are absolutely years from that. But to go back, 
an override is not a guarantee for this. So enterprise funds could support mm -hmm. this. It just depends on what's the appetite for expansion. Enterprise funds could support the 87. OMR, the 87? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's just what do you want the rates to be? And so unlike the general fund, we could supplement the enterprise fund with general obligations. But we have a self-supporting system per se. And our long-term financial plan has started to incorporate and build into these funds, <laughs> right? So uh, unlike, hey, we have $86 million, tomorrow we need to raise those funds. Financially, we are forecasted out and advance a lot of our rate increases to start to build the cost of the debt service. Okay. That can be focused into anything because it's not an obligation per se, it's an obligation to financial forecast and contingency. But to your point beyond that, we do need to go through the exercise of the cost of measure. So that 86 million is a very, very high level estimate of what recent 1 million gallon plants are, are focused on, roughly in the raw water capacity at least. Mm -hmm. But we are going to fail defense. And we do not have the ability, like other communities, to shut down a plant mm -hmm. and survive off of the two which other communities will do as they start to incorporate the defense. We need to explore how we manage our water treatment capacity and our water production. So we have two phases on like other communities. We could, if MWA was closer, there was a, if, if that bond bill included MWA, we could modularly lease treatment processes that will get us through PFAS as we talk about phasing out sources or phasing in sources. That will be part of this process. Remember when I started, I said it's all interconnected because we don't have the ability to close OMR. If we put a PFAS treatment plant at Rockland in well four, it's still pumping PFAS into the system and that's inefficient. So we may look at a, co a, a conversation conceptually, very, very high level, where we have either a centralized or a dual PFAS treatment facility and we pipe on Mara directly to it versus back feeding into the system. We have to go through all of that exercise and that's included. And then that will provide us some guidance, one with real with higher level costs. That's not, I'm still in a, this is SE stage. It's really high level, but it will come up with a better cost in that kind of But it will also expand on the share factor, what we will have to spend, not only in treatment capacity improvement, but water quality. And then that will be gauged against MWRA. What we know about MWRA is they have excess capacity. They can meet 100% of Maynard's current, peak, and forecasted pools. And that means development, as you all saw, the development that I had to deny, uh, we could handle all that development with, with MWRA. What it also brings is water quality that will meet today's standards and the future standards. All that will be measured against what our abilities. And then we can look at that from a financial perspective. Then we can kind of bridge that gap as mm -hmm. we know more information. So I would love to see where this hospital goes, how fast and the array moves in that process. They still have to go through a major design bidding process. That can take five years before the North Shore itself or even see that infrastructure. But when we're planning, even OMR, so we'll be lucky to implement Rockland in five centers. Expedited which I have told this board many times, if we stay to our financial plan with our rates and we continue to invest in that process, we can hopefully expedite that in four years. A lot of that comes with the piloting and permitting through the EP. OMR is probably 10, 15, 20 years away, even if we stayed on the original plan, just because the cost burden is so high. Rockland Ave projected right now, if we find a couple of well sources and we're able to put a well field on, and do the modifications that we need. It's probably going to cost roughly almost the same amount as what we just did at Well Borway, which is 13 to 15 million dollars total. That's not including fee industry. We have to start to include that because we're going to run. So it, it's, I don't want to say OMR or I'm going to raise a pipe dream, but it is good to have the conversation when we're talking about long term plan at the David's point is what's next? What's our highest priority? But the biggest issue that may are typically had in regards to its water um, water improvement projects is it would never fund this and it would sit. So nothing's moving, so the ball just set. So you didn't get piloting working, you didn't get anything going. And then when the time is to need, 
which we kind of are in right now as a community, we're denying developments. The quad board is, has talked about we need to have development, long term investment to handle a lot of our general fund obligations. Well, this is the bottleneck. So as long as these processes move, we can expedite that four year window versus seven year versus 10 year window. And then we can make those decisions. I will say this the conceptual idea of Rockland Ave and a new well source will be able to enhance development sooner rather than later. MWA is a final source. Old Melrose Road is a final source. Something that I would retire and never, it would be over with as the future generations of Maynard. And I'm talking, I'm only 43. I work until I'm 64 for the pension. So uh, that's 20 years out before that would be an obligation. Even MWA, even if we got lucky, that's still years away because they also have to go through the same piloting and permit process, not necessarily piloting, but they do what's called an interbasin transfer. So they're taking water from one area of the state and then transferring it to another, and they have to do environmental studies, which takes you to see. Okay. All right, I will move to it. <clears throat> yeah, just a quick question about the um, the litigation, PFAS litigation that's going mm -hmm. on. Um, as I recall, it's uh what amount of about 146,000 is that right no so we so yes and no right. so that's the phase two so just very high level because we're still in that litigation issue right so the manufacturers of PFAS the major manufacturers 3M and DuPont are sued by hundreds of thousands of communities such as Maine with the class action lawsuit right now our projected allocation of funds from that specific lawsuit are between three and three point five million dollars. There is two phases of trusts fund money for that. That is direct violation now, meaning there's PFAS in our system currently. We detect it, we know it, that's phase one. Phase two is any future PFAS, which is the 146. And that's if we dig a new well or test a new well and we find defense. Is this topic that's public that. or is this? It is. It's a public litigation that's already been set. Okay. But there is a second litigation that we have not joined in because it's just started. And that is the firefighter, which I won't, I don't have any information to do. But so, yes, you, David, it, it was. It I didn't want to set. violate, uh, you know. Uh, no, we're not. Yeah. It's executive it's session issues. No, it's not. How we potentially obligate those funds for you. So is it fair to say that even that three and a half million is still going to be, if, if it was to ever surface, would still be a part of the kind of sort of drop in the ocean of the expenses required to actually cover uh, the work? Yes, that it's do. a real shame. Mike. So I will tell you this. Now, the class action lawsuit was um, within court, and I want to say it was North Carolina, which is the federal court that we was applied to. And the judge's ruling at the end, his executive summary was DuPont and 3M are too big to fail and we can't have them fail. This is what they can include. And you can look at it both ways and how that affects the federal economy versus us. But from a local perspective, 3.5 million is not even 33% of what one PFAS treatment facility would cost. But it is better than it's top. A lot of this burden is going to fall on local taxpayers as typical policy changes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, uh, move to approve the contract number 1469 for the Department of Public Works Drinking Water Supply and Treatment Master Plan with Stantec Consulting Services, Inc. in the amount of $400,000 as presented, authorizing use of digital signatures if approved. Second. It can't possibly be any more discussion. All in favor? <laughs> I gotta take one last shot at the guy. Chris, I do this. Are you gonna see? Are you gonna see? Okay. Well, then I don't. I mean, in a few days. Yes, you are. All right. Um, now we're on to um, our policies as it relates to food vendors and hawkers and peddlers. Steve's up. Do we? I only have. Do we draft this, or did the council draft this for us? Or did, uh, was it kind of a little, 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 bit, little bit of it, and then uh, we had some modifications. Okay, you gave some comments. All right. Steve so, Silverstein, uh, 
Executive Director of Municipal Services. All right, sir. Um, why don't just why don't we start with the um, food vendors piece, and then we'll move on to the hawkers and whatnot. And they're both kind of related. So, Greg, do you want to frame it in any? Let me put you on the spot there. The framing of this is no. I think. I think no, this is a fair point. I'll give a little bit of um, maybe additional context, but I think everyone remembers the the taco truck that we're trying to figure out, you know, whether or not to permit it onto the onto the public ways. But an additional sort of chapter is that I was um, a, a messaged by someone who's considering or was asking if they could sell their art. I may have the details incorrect, but but I think they want to sell their art on the roadside. Um, and then I had asked council, how do we, is that allowed? And they said, oh, that's a hawker peddler's license. And then, um, looked it up and the state has regulations related to that. And to Steve's point, and it's all kind of coincidental that then, then this taco truck and we're trying to figure out that out too, but, um, it is very later layered and, and you can, you can sort of approach it different ways. Um, some towns have the permits to have a food truck go through the select board. Some towns have it really s sort of um, at the board of health level, but you know, the, but Maynard select board generally does um, exude authority over the public way. So that's, that's you know, parking, sidewalks, streets. Um, that's, that's generally what this board has done. But in addition to that, and I think Steve can get into this, um, Think of it very similar to like a common victory license. So even though the board were to issue a common Vic license for a restaurant, it doesn't mean that the board is saying you can start serving food because the restaurant still needs to pass the food permits in the board of health regulations and the fire code, et cetera. Um, and then similarly for a food truck and Steve can get into the details. Um, you know, there's still, there's still sort of, um, um, associated regulations, whether it be from the police department or the fire department, and especially the the health department. So, um, the, yeah, I'm, if that sort of helps the sort of like context of this discussion, think of it very similar to like a mobile restaurant, but also consider the hawkers peddlers because there may be something besides food being asked to sell. But if you're selling something, you you that's what we're that's what we're proposing if you're going to sell something you need a hot good peddlers if you're going to sell something and that something happens to be food you're going to need a food truck permit is that right but steve correct you've you've done a lot more research and talked to council many you know, more uh, times more like procedure no, oh, thank you okay, okay. Uh, good. It was good are you planning okay. a presentation or do you want us to ask questions based on our Greg just gave the presentation. It's very, it was very good. Uh, questions, if you have questions. Yeah, because uh, we all, you know, this all context. Greg. Yeah, Greg, you're done. I'm, I'm done. I didn't think to talk. I thought he was going to do all the talking. So now I'm going to stop talking. Okay. And do you have a presentation, or do you wish to? No talk? presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, Go ahead. All right. As I read through this, there were a couple of issues that sort of hit me, and I, I want to see what the you're, you're going to food trucks before hawkers, right? Yeah, food trucks. Um, although to Greg's point, I guess they are related in some way, but I'm, um, I was focused initially on the food trucks. Um, uh, one thing I don't want to do, and it is if we're going to be inviting food trucks into the community, I don't want to be an overly hard burden for food trucks to be able to operate. Otherwise it's not going to work. Um, you know, some of the stuff about notifying of butters and everything else, I appreciate the fact that we want to notify, but that can be really burdensome if you're coming in for a one day event and you have to notify all these abutters and what happened, you know, what, what rights do the abutters have? Can they appeal, you know, all this type of stuff. The other issue that I'm interested in is this $90 fee that seemed low to me, or I think it was $90 seemed low to me given that um uh, you know i think we heard the outcry from people that were saying you know that uh, uh mid brick and mortar pay taxes and uh and have a lot more overhead expenses than 90 dollars fees to the town um and is that equitable uh, so that's that's an issue I'd, I'd like to address and then the whole issue of uh 
and you know, I, I appreciate keeping trying to keep the food trucks from the downtown business district area, which was incorporated into the, the plan. But I'm troubled by the fact that somebody can move, you know, 10 feet down the road from in front of Gigi's to right in front of town hall. You're no longer in the downtown. It really doesn't achieve, I think, what the obligation was. The other thing is, uh, I understand that many uh, neighborhoods uh, are starting to frequently when they have their neighborhood parties in the summertime, they want to have a truck, a food truck as part of their celebration. And this seems to add a big hurdle for that. So uh, I guess overall issue is unintended consequences of making a policy that becomes overly restrictive and in effect back backfires on us and becomes not really what we were looking for, which was to preserve and protect and defend the uh, the downtown, immediate downtown restaurants that were being impacted. So those are my observations. Uh, I guess the board can, can throw rocks at those ideas or thoughts or build upon them with some concerns that other concerns that might be there to talk about. Are you looking for specific changes, David? Say again? Are you looking for specific changes? I'm looking for clarification more mm -hmm. so than changes, just to how, how all these things apply. For specific changes on, the only one that I might say a specific change is I'd like to review the price of a $90. So you want to start with? Sorry, no related question to that one actually. So, um, did you take a look at other towns and what some policies? Could you give us a an overview of what you found from other towns and then with the focus on the price? Because that was my question on how that that was concluded at as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, we can take. Uh, let me start off with the butters. So, a lot of this was generated from anecdotes that we had in town. Obviously, you know, we had the, the public comments from. The downtown restaurants that saw the food trucks as an existential threat. Uh, there was one non food related but mobile vending uh, kind of controversy that had arisen where a flower truck had been invited. <laughs> and uh, there was some, there was a brick and mortar business that found that that was kind of distasteful, especially because of the timing of it. So from that point came the insertion of the informing of butters, specifically in the in the downtown area. So it was um, two. Although when I read through uh, to that point, um, the only time we would allow, according to what I was reading, the downtown business district is during town events, so everybody would be aware that it was coming anyway. Right, and then they would they would still have to inform. So there would be, you know, the town event would be. You know, pronounce and then when the license so the select board basically the idea of the of this policy is to have your okay over any and everyone who's coming into town to sell from a vendor. So you have the say you have uh, an event that that's scheduled when that when X, Y, or Z food truck comes in, say that it's a Say that it's a, a Thai or a Thai fusion type of food truck, then any of the businesses would come and they could they could say, you know, we are opposed to this specific food truck. Do we require that of any um anyone else who's seeking a license? Like if if there were a restaurant seeking a liquor license, I think most of our restaurants have liquor licenses, but if there was one that didn't have one and came seeking that, would we require that that restaurant let all the other restaurants in town with liquor licenses know that they were pursuing a liquor license? I do not believe so. No, yeah. we do not. Yeah. So then what's different here? Yeah, I mean, the analogy would be the cannabis shops that are very, very close to one another. Do they let each other know when a new one's opening or when they're seeking a license? Do they, it's part of their process? Only through to public. Let everyone yeah, else only through the public process. So we've added a step specific to food trucks. In, that in, a lot of well, we got a lot, but that one burden that we haven't burdened other license seekers with a burden of yeah, I think you could probably characterize it as such, but that's why, and that's what I wanted from Greg. Sorry, my question was, was 
poorly framed was how does this, you know, how do you want to play this out in terms of the fact that this is very rough draft for an issue that is kind of multifaceted. Um, yes, there's a lot of, you know, the, the select board should have a policy to regulate the food trucks, but a lot of it does kind of come into contact with the a, a tendency towards anti-competition, which, you know, there is something that should be said for protecting the businesses that are here that are paying taxes, but also there's reputational concerns. So it's, it's so it's a bit difficult. Um, which, yeah. And so I also look to, to Town of Hudson, Concord, Grafton, Tisbury, uh, and there's no what Concord, there's nothing set, there's no one template that's been applied. There's various ways to handle it. So talk about some of the commonalities, please. And if you could talk about the abutters for those towns, question that was just raised, and then the price point. The abutters, if I have, if I recall correctly, I think I was I cherry picked that from Grafton, where they had notification of abutters. Any other any other towns have anything similar to that? No, but they have varying degrees of, of oversight and heavy handedness in terms of who could come in. Uh, you know, placing food trucks on a list or, you know, allowing them and then allowing them to uh, even sell at specific town events. That's Concord. Uh, the money, the annual fee is fairly consistent. I made it $90 down from $100. $90 because the health fee, the annual health fee for having a food truck is also $90. So there's consistency there. Uh, what other towns do have is, and this is probably a... Uh, a, a, a distinction that needs to be made is you have the food truck license. So they come in and you bless them and you say, okay, this food truck can operate here in Maynard. And then you also give them a permit, which we don't really, I don't believe that we charge for use of town property at this point, but there are other towns that do that. So in Hudson, for example, if I were a food truck operator, I get my food truck license, $100 for the year. That means that's they've vetted me. It's done. If I want to operate in their regulated food truck area, which is basically downtown Hudson, I would pay ten dollars every time I go there, which is for townwide events. And there's a cap of two food trucks that are allowed there at any given uh, downtown. So but they, if they're so only... by varying levels of you know layers of complexity that you could add or not or subtract. And that's either on town property or on private property in the downtown or really district. That's just on public property in the downtown. Okay. It's private property. Currently, no need for a permit, but you still have to get the license just to be in the town. Of but you wouldn't, this wouldn't preclude the current situation, which is private property owner with a business allowing the food truck to come on certain dates. Right. So take the taco truck du jour. They have, they would have to get the license, but to go operate at Amory's. Or to operate at Ericsson's, they don't have to get any They're, permit or they don't have to pay yeah. any additional. This, this wouldn't change any of the Cousins Lobster truck or the taco truck from going to Avery's or Ericsson's. That's right. Only the taco truck now would have to get the select board food truck license. They have to come That's to what the this would do. Was there any? Not, hold on, no, I want to be clear on this. Yep. Right now, the taco truck can go and get the normal health um, board license, right? And go to Avery's and Cousins will get the same health board license and go to Ericsson's, right? This wouldn't change any of that. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, was there any exploration done on the whole conversation on uh, meals tax? So the the all food trucks have to register with the Department of Revenue and report their earnings on uh, they they report on a monthly basis and then through the magic of DOR there's some formula where the the towns in which they've worked received a portion of the meals tax. So if they work in Maynard, they are paying into. So we would recognize some type of revenue from these food trucks in Maynard. Yes. It's just the percentage would be determined by the uh, DOR in some back room. Yeah. So that's already, that should already be happening for cousins and for free. Yeah. And but Greg, are we sure we're, are, are we recognizing that? Are we seeing that revenue come in from food trucks? I haven't, I haven't actually, I don't know, Steve, have you looked into how much I haven't asked? I looked, I looked online at DOR site and you could see for the local option tax, what we get on a quarterly basis, it doesn't break it down any farther. So Jen Welch 
like that. So, I mean, is, is there- Yeah, we can ask Jen. Is there, yeah, please do, because I want to I know if there's a, like, a line item that she identifies that says, this is our food truck revenue uh, versus uh, the prepared food at, uh, um, hmm. you know. The yeah, meals, the meals, like the sources of the meals tax, I get it. Yeah, uh, the other question, um, how about issues like facilities for employees? Bathrooms. Um, are there requirements for a business to have access for their employees to be able to use a restroom? There. And if so, how does that apply? How do these people assure that they have access for their employees to a restroom? So and this is probably best covered by our health director, but that's all under the health code. So each food truck has to have a service or servicing area where it, it accounts for clean water, for disposal. disposal I saw right that. that address. Yeah, and then uh, I believe all, uh, everything under um, industrial, what's it called? Not workman's comp, but like, you know, uh, uh, labor standards uh, are, should all, are all accounted for. That's just under the state, if I'm, if I'm not sure. My understanding is that the state requirement is that uh, permanent or portable restrooms have to be available um, for use during food preparation and along the route. And I'm guessing that that's part of the licensing procedure. <clears throat> but who provides this? Uh, I infer that it's the responsibility of the food truck when they choose their location to make sure that they have those facilities available, that they make those kinds of arrangements. Right. Do we know I'll, I'll do we know if when Picos or whatever her name was, what their arrangement was along those lines when they were sit, setting up outside here? Um as per what they put on their application and any subsequent inspections, yeah. Theoretically, yes. What was their plan, do you know? Uh I, well, I mean at Ericsson's, I know that the well the, the Ericsson's uh, that's private, so that's not a big when they were here. That's a good question. I could find out for you when they were parked here. Uh perhaps, yeah, I don't know. I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything separate from the trailer, you know, that would indicate a, a rest area, a restroom. Uh I'm sure that Hudson and all the towns that allow them must have some type of but that's something we should explore so that we're aware uh, I, I have a question about um the requirement for this uh or the application to go through the select board and i see that some towns do some don't draft on their done uh i don't think concord do or maybe well on that so what are the in terms of what was raised earlier about um, making it, uh, you know, that it's not overly burdensome. What are the pros and cons about requiring this to go through select board, um, as opposed to just through the board of health, providing we have a, a good policy in place for the board of health to follow? So the, the I mean, the, our board of health policy is in line with the rest of the state. Um, with this food truck policy, it's more, it's an additional layer of regulation, to be frank, but it gives you increased oversight of what's going on in a community, right? So specifically in vis-a-vis -vis the use of public property, uh, you are now in the position to say, okay, we, we the downtown overlay district or downtown area, downtown Maynard, not be here except for in cases X, Y, and Z, uh, or even in the case of this town event, we still say that we don't want a food truck. So you have an additional lever to say you can or cannot be on municipal property. And I guess the same thing would be with the, the neighborhood parties. You, you could say you entertain through public hearing whether or not the there should be approval for the food truck to be at, you know, uh, at a neighborhood block party. Because even if the, you know, 75% of neighbors agree that, yeah, we should have food trucks, if there's 25% that are vocal, I mean, you entertain them in the in the course of a public hearing and 
to make the determination of whether or not you want the food trucks to be to be there. Um, yeah, I, I guess I guess so. In a neighborhood block party been in someone's driveway, then it's private. Then problem. maybe up, then if, and they have their food license and all of their yeah, it's a loophole. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm just curious. Like I, I, I don't want to make it so onerous that if you're having like a graduation party and you want to have a food truck in your driveway, you have to come to the select board. Yeah, That's it's not... private property at that. Point. Okay, yeah, so and it's, it's not the same case. situation if you have at Eric's. Yeah. So whatever. Well, no, because it's private property for a private event. That's even less restrictive than yeah. private property right. selling in public. Right. That that does require the rules. So I think. So it's the birthday party where it's either really on your property could still be all set. Yeah. Uh, uh, one comment that Mike made, uh, I don't see coming to the board for approval as being honest and burdens. I do feel that some of the restrictions that are here about a butter notification might be, but I want to, you know, I want to see uh, you know, the more paperwork that people have to get involved in, not coming to say, hey, I want to conduct my business. I think that's appropriate for the board, especially if they're going to be using public property. I think it's appropriate for the board to have some oversight of it and to understand what's going on within the within the confines of the town. Um, the other point is I'd like to hear uh, the other board members' reactions to the restriction of these types of things in the overlay district area. And whether or not it should be an absolute, um, unless it's a town event, um, it maybe, maybe not. But because um, otherwise, I don't know where they'd go uh, to have any type of, uh, you know, body of people that that are that are available to them. I guess, I that's, like, to look I guess that's up to the individual business, but um, yeah. you know, I just don't know where they would park in order to get enough people to make it worth their while um, to conduct it. Is, is that or outside the OD? Uh, the downtown overlay district, um, right now, the way this is written is they're restricted. They can't go there unless it's a town event. Yeah. Um, and that that's, maybe that's where we want to go. I don't know, but uh, from, I don't know if it, if uh, the food truck's going to be too excited to be sitting on, um, you know, name a street um, where, where there's not much activity. And even if you did name that street, then the people in the neighborhood, because we heard so dense and residential, they would say, well, what's this food truck doing camped outside of my house? Yeah. That's kind of mm -hmm. offset. That's why, you know, the other, you would then say yes for them to on a case basis. The other towns that you looked at, do they also, I mean, this essentially other than town events precludes food trucks from being on public property near you know, business activity. Do other policies that you looked at from other towns similarly preclude food trucks from being in a downtown area with business activity other than for town events? Oh, yeah. Some of them specifically say the streets that you cannot be on at all. And then Hudson, having spoken with uh, representatives from Hudson and actually the Aspen Valley Chamber of Commerce, it was a picked battle between every all the businesses. It was basically what we saw here. The, the downtown businesses said, what the heck is this? We pay so much money. We pay the taxes. We pay into our bid. And now you're, people come mobile. You know, they can escape whenever they want to. They avoid paying taxes here and there. Uh, and so Hudson's kind of decision was to say, you can't be in our downtown unless we say you can, even then, we're capping it, but otherwise, stay out of this community. How long ago did Hudson have that conversation? 2019, I want to say. Yeah. It's, a, but it's, it's not something that I ever paid any attention to until we had this conversation here the first night. So, but in, in moving around and noticing food trucks, you kind of notice that they're more or less all on private property unless it's a, a town event like uh, you know one any of the ones that we have annually or the we you know farmers markets you're starting to see them in off to the side in farmers markets but you I, I just don't see them on streets yeah I don't see food trucks on many true. streets that aren't part of uh, whether it's a weekly food truck situation or something like that you just I, I'm not seeing it so I don't in, you know I'm not I'm going from here you know to you know, Burlington, Lexington, Waltham, I mean, the, the places that are around us. And I'm just not seeing food trucks on public streets 
except that they're in parking lots of private facilities like Ericsson's, like there's a couple of farms um, as you head in on 117 that you see them when they're on a Saturday down by Drumlin Farm. There's that typically there's one in the parking lot some days, but not on Main Street yeah, you're right. or Summer Street or Powder Mill. They're not on those roads. So does this create that? Is that what we create here with um, with 2.7? You know, food truck license may be issued to an MFV with an attached with any attached condition, conditions, limitations, or restrictions required by the board for exercise on public property outside the downtown overlay district. Yes, it does. You know, but then they come and they make the, their case to you for why they should be allowed up there. But I mean, yeah. the private property is working out so based on what you see here. Yes. Yeah. Why you go through the house? I mean, it's it's kind of funny. Where it seems as though the situation, in a sense resolved itself, but I think we need to be prepared if this situation arises again to have an answer for the next guy that says, you know, this is really what we, we want and expect. Here's what it is. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really think anything in here is too onerous. I mean, you know, it's a, uh, 20 minutes of paperwork and a $90 fee. And then we discuss where you're going and what you're doing some, someday, just like we discussed Shakespeare in the park, you know, that type of thing. And that's, that's what we're really looking at. No, Other than the informing of the but of the abutters. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's, that's a tough that's a tough like one of butters. For other people, I feel like we should be consistent for licensing. I, 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 I do think that's kind of difficult only because when we do a, a taking or we do a street improvement or we do some of those things that require um an, a butter notification, the list of butters seems extraordinarily long. You don't even know who the abutters are. Yeah, right? no, well, that's another problem. But, but when you look at like, <laughs> you know, the, the, the short answer to the story is, I look, I consider my abutters anybody who's anybody whose property oh, touches mine yeah. uh, or in, and is directly across the street type of thing. But when we do those other things in town, the list of abutters for those type of things is lengthy, to say the least. Well, uh, do we have a, do you, do we, or can we create a um, something in, that you know limits that that what's considered an abutter. Can we can we say what an abutter is as a board? I mean, so this one says abutters within five hundred feet of wherever the okay. I think it's everyone within five hundred feet. Yeah. So if you were sitting in the middle, you know, if you are on Mason Street, it's basically most, most of downtown. downtown. <laughs> you're most of downtown, like where you live, right? Yeah. If you're yeah. within five hundred feet, feet my house, it that's a lot of abutters. I mean, right. in the same in my, you know. I mean, it may every everything's a little bit five hundred feet, I guess. We're so we're so densely, you know, densely settled. But and that's that's I don't know that that's unfair or fair. I'm just the butters. It may be overkill, but it's something we could look at and adjust if we have to. Yeah, I, I figured this should be reviewed at you know some interval either six months or a year to massage you know the fine points. See what's working. Yeah, it's um, see see uh, the other thing is see how many applications we get. Yeah, that could that could resolve the issue itself if we don't get too many applications that people realize, well, if I go to Ericsson's, I just have to talk to the board of health and I'm saying. Or, you know, it this this is eliminated in a, in a sense by people going to private property and, and setting up a camp there if they have a board of health permit. Let me ask Tom Staff to write this so the Economic Development Committee, but the Economic Development Committee Booker reviewed this at their last meeting. Yes, we we talked about it at the EDC, uh, and then went back to the lawyers, and so we have multiple levels of review. We didn't see the final. No. Oh, they didn't see the final. No, that's that's good one. If this the discussion the draft of it, oh, we had the discussion. Sorry, what was that, Ernest? We had the discussion. That's you know, Steve went back to uh, looking at other towns and what. You know, council, and this is what So, so the committee hasn't seen this. The final thing. The director, this my understanding was to get input from the EDC, to do the draft, and then get the draft to the select board as soon as possible. It's like we're going back to the EDC since it only meets once a month. Well, I, but that's why are we consulting with them? We're going to make a decision without them seeing the final draft, right? Like, so why don't we send it back? So send it back to the EDC and then and then bring it back to us, right? What? 
Are we meant to make a decision yeah. on this? Today? We don't have to make a decision. No, 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 no. We don't have to. Not to not given the time, we've probably found the point where we've all met neighbors in other places. The yeah. urgency that was there yeah. at the last meeting has been reduced. Yeah. So that would be. Yeah. So why, why don't we, you know, why don't we do that? Why don't we go back to EDT and with the draft that they get? And if there's any other questions, they can resolve that. And then we'll come back and take a look again. And maybe, maybe there'll be some other questions. Can I ask them? You can ask as many questions as you like. Okay, I just have maybe two other questions. Um, on 4.6, when it's on public property, food truck must operate within the width of the parking space. But to get a food truck to a location, it requires the vehicle and the actual truck. So how's that physically possible? Detach the vehicle. And then the other, so they can't, and then the other vehicle has to go away from town property? Well, well yeah. there's the width and the length of the parking space. So some some trucks are some 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 are self-contained. The, the the motorized unit is a food truck, a van, you know, like a, a, a food van, a food truck. The fifth, oh and then there's a trip, then the, the tackle guy, he his unit is towed by his, his truck. And then, mm -hmm. you know, when they were here downtown, they actually parked food truck, space behind it, space, and then the mm -hmm. truck. Yeah. And I don't know, I assume over at Ericsson's they it's I think it looks like it's just Sitting all by itself, and that the pickup truck is parked up in the corner. Yeah, right, exactly. But yeah, your point is is well taken. So the, the length, I mean, with those ones that are built in, they definitely go over the length. They're, of yeah, they're like they use they usually twenty feet long. Yeah, exactly. Like RV size. Hmm? Some of them are RV size. Yeah, some of them are good size. Not so concerned about the length, and really, it would be is two ninety dollars. These are two spots, but <laughs> you're, you're supposed to operate from the width of that. But I believe the Tiger Truck had like cones spreading out into the road, and that's oh, when they were here. When yeah, for the week or two where they were sitting up, yeah. So, and part of that is just conflicting kind of uh, guidance about all right, well, have a cone, make sure that you know traffic is circulating properly, or that pedestrians aren't going behind the the, the truck and potentially coming into traffic. I think that's what they had. So. It, it looked like that was exactly what that was more of a safety concern than it was a, a size concern but because the trailer and the truck either or can only be a certain width and they can't be any wider than a tractor trailer and that's you know literally supposed to fit in that same spot you know width wise but and was it the vehicle within the width of the space it's, it's pretty close a, a, a regular a regular food truck or a thing you know, like a rv that's Typically, you know, not a an oversized mm -hmm. one, but a smaller RV in a food truck typically will. The width is there's not a lot of room in it. That guy's usually got a grill in a, a spot to turn around, and he's facing you. It's it's usually a a, a pretty um, common width to the width of a typical landscaping trailer or a typical you know boat trailer, and they they have to fit within a certain guideline because when they're on the highway, they have to fit between the lines. So that's that's the width is pretty standard, yeah. Yeah. Um, and to be perfectly frank with you, a lot of this is just a hodgepodge of various policies that I saw across the entire Commonwealth. So it's like a little bit of you know, eye of news and you know, retina of which you know, to throw everything in and then have with the select board and you can forever whittle it down to something that's okay. You're gonna so so okay, so we're gonna send the food truck regulations back for a review from the EDC, and then we're gonna get on to the hawkers and peddlers. Now, those typically guys that like we see at carnivals and stuff, is that typically what that is? You know, we have like parade, yeah, like this. Oktoberfest, they get a guy that's dragging a cart behind him with balloons yeah, and right. Lovers, guns and all that. Is that, and is that what that is, or is this going on to different other things? Well, I think I, from my review of it, it, it also includes, as, as Steve was commenting on earlier, a type of, uh, apparently somebody who wanted to sell some artwork just sitting on the sidewalk. So uh, I guess similar to what you would see when you go to some of the artsy towns in uh, uh, the Cape or in, even out in Western Mass, where there are artists who sit on the sidewalk and uh, they put up easels and they sell their stuff even though their store may not be in front of them yeah exactly yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but most of the time in Newbury Street, at least it's associated with the business that might be behind them. Uh, but in in certain towns, especially in Western Mass, you see people out there selling things that are unrelated. That's what I see more so than the, the guy pulling the grocery cart with the balloons hanging off of it that you see at parades. Um, those are peddlers too, but uh, a little different. I, my thought on this was more the person who's trying to create their own small little business on the sidewalk. So, I mean, it's anybody who goes town to town, uh, either on foot or with a cart, certain side, or from an animal, according to NGL, it really kind of harkens back to 19th century. This, this, uh, rule. Yeah. So number two is kind of interesting. It says, if sales are not being conducted from a tent, booth, building, or other structure, a hawkers and peddlers license is required. You have to physically be moving around, I think. Yeah, sounds good. Can't sit still. Sorry, kid. Keep no, up. Like, I think you do. I think you have to be walking. That's why when they do it in front yeah, of I, I get it. Down the street. I think that was, like, the spirit of the law. I, I'm curious to know, uh, in the, the section four there, <laughs> what hawkers and peddlers may not sell. <laughs> Um, why small artificial flowers and miniature flags are included in that? Where did that come from? Uh, this is actually, this is mostly from MGL, so I think it's probably the, uh, the flower lobby had that thing. So when you say, oh, so that, if it's from MGL, then that, then that would, would have to meet their standards. Maybe? Yeah, I mean, this was kind of a, a no-brainer. It was mostly, th this came from council. Council said, take this, and then we just, you know, Added some additional details around the engines. Yeah. Why are we repeating MGL? Because now MGL changes. Now we have this weird artificial flower and then apply it to the gym that's nobody knows how it got there. And the people really cut from the community also. Why why aren't we just defaulting follow MGL and addition? Here's what we would expect in Maynard, which is to go here, well that I, I thought MGL was sort of the standard. Right. So why are we repeating MGL and R one through We don't. Yeah. We don't. We don't have to. So the the mass general law and the and the guidance from the state is that towns and municipalities can add their own policies on top of, but without conflicting with the mass general law. Usually, it's very public safety oriented. So the so the police chief may say, "Hey, this is not safe. You can't do it this close to an intersection or or whatever the case may be." But it could be. But the the town through the executive body or otherwise could add your own regulations. The a police chief may say, um, I don't want you to be so close to the street edge. I don't know. But the police chief may not determine which street that is, but the executive board, the the, the select board, they may. You may say, here are the particular streets. You have to do everything the chief says, but here's the particular streets that you can operate on. I, I'll be I'll be give a little bit more context. The the artists that reached out to me weeks ago, um asked to set up sales at there's like a dirt sort of roundabout around the the Maynard welcome to Maynard sign as you get into Sudbury um is that is that um well um I'm forgetting that which street it is but if you continue into Sudbury then that's the soccer fields on your right um that's that's Parker Street Parker Street no, yeah. no, it's it's Waltham Street. We're Waltham Street. No, it's, he's talking about right where the where the soccer field is is, is on Maynard Road, which then turns into Parker Street. Yeah. With the sign yeah. is Maynard Park. Yeah, that's Parker Street. Yeah. Yeah, and so so there's a big you know there's that big dirt turnaround. I think there's someone's driveway back there too. But either way, yeah, there's yeah. Some, that's yeah. Right now. yeah, yeah. So that's where they want to set up shop. So so but they that's publicly owned, so they can't just do that. So that's why the hawkers peddler's license came up. Um, and Steve, so what's represented here? Is this all taken straight from MGL or did we did Maynard add in that you can't sell furs or smaller? Is that straight from MGL? Oh, I, I was like, what should we not say? Yeah. So so we today today today, do we is this an existing policy? Do we have an existing hawkers policy or no? We don't. We don't okay, have okay, okay. Other than mass general law. Right, right, right. yeah. Okay, okay. I was just, I was just curious. So this is, this is the states basically. Yeah. So why? What's the purpose of adding? If the state has this policy, and I looked a little bit online, and it looks like for most towns, you have to get the license from the state. 
and then you go to the police chief before, you know, per Greg's point, that this is mostly a public safety issue because the person has to be walking around. So are we adding a step that the Hawkers and Panthers would have to come to the select board and also get our approval, even though they have their, their license from the state? And, or is this instead of them going to the police department? No, it's in, it's in tandem with, so you would get the state level license and then the town license. So, so it feels like, I, I guess I'm curious why. So you're right. You could delegate your authority. So you so you don't have to make a policy. You could say it could be up to the police chief or the town administrator. You, it doesn't well, have to be a select board policy. So okay. the, I guess I guess the question is is that it's the most um, glaring example of this is Christmas parade has typically always had a couple hawkers yeah. along the route. What what have they done? Like what what is a what has um, those guys? Hawkers, I guess we'll call them, what have those hawkers or peddlers done in prior years to be licensed by the town, if anything? Have they should come be, in all for a license or have they just those details? Them? I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job in Zoom here, but those details should have been included in the application. So so similar to a food truck um being included in in a cultural council event in Memorial Park. If it should be listed as to and if it's not, then you know whether it be the police or otherwise, someone should say, "Hey, you weren't included in the in the Christmas or the Maynard Fest or the whatever event application." You know that has to be detailed to that level of like what's included in the in the in the so sort of the the master application. Right. Oh, and the, the the reason for the distinction between the state and the local licensing is because. The state level is the state level, but say for a specific locality, one of the components is to go and to announce to the town, I'm going to be going through here. So then you have to get an attestation from the local police chief, which says, or, you know, from the licensing authority. And it's specifically as mandated under chapter 101, it's called the certificate of character, mm -hmm. which says that you're someone who has good morals and an upstanding person. Mm -hmm. uh, which again, it's very kind of 19th century, but also the, the, the function is not entirely, you know, out of place. It is to say, because, all right, so the reason that it's very closely linked with the food truck policy is, and it's that it's not redundant, is hawkers and peddlers licenses in the context of the food truck policy is meant to specifically be for the people who are dealing with the exchange of money to make sure that those, there won't, there won't be any kind of like malfeasance on the part of, you know, whoever's taking the, running the Venmo. In the food truck? Yes. So you need, so for the food truck license, you have to have the Hoppers and Peddlers license? In most municipalities, we do. We then don't have to accept it. We don't have to adopt it, but it's very, very common practice across the country. Then in the language for the Hoppers and Peddlers policy from the MGL, very specifically says merchandise by foot. And it also talks about people like pulling parts and stuff. So it seems like it's a little bit redundant. Or no, but uh, that, uh, that's where I'm a bit confused, and yeah. I'm thinking back to it. Doesn't seem like to, it, 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 it seems to, like to you, the, from a tent booth building or other structure, which is what I would assume the trailer or the food truck, is the other food truck represents the other structure, which means they don't need a license. And and but even let's go back to the whole issue with the flower sales back years of you know five three years ago. Um, according to this. Um, there was uh, under number five, hawkers and peddlers may sell the following items without underlined a license. And one of them are uncultivated wildflowers, fruits, nuts, and berries. The person who was selling those flowers, my recollection is they were selling wildflowers. No, I don't know. I think they were. They were, uh, so in effect, we had no authority to tell them they couldn't be there in the first place mm -hmm. because they were in a an established tent booth building or other structure. And they were on public property. But so that would have been our only authority to, to rule on it is because they were on public property, but nothing prevents somebody from taking up a parking space and saying, I'm gonna park here and I'll pay my quarter for it for an hour. And according to the state law, if you're selling wildflowers, you're good to go. 
Well, no, but they still would have had to go because of the MGL offering the peddler's license. They still would have had to go to the police department to get the character. Uh, I don't know what kind of they would have used license if they were if it was indeed wildflowers, they would need to do it at all. So Maynard has not required that hawkers and peddlers go to the police department. No. We don't have any we don't have any policy. We haven't had any we haven't had any policy. Oh, I see. Okay. So there's been no policy at all. I thought oh. these people were going to the police department, but no, that's not been happening at I said you must you you know you must comply with all town parking regulations. So they could have just put a dime into the into the machine, put their little truck there. And sold their wildflowers, and we had no authority to say anything to them, and we took a bunch of crap. For that. No, well, the one one difference is they were going to display under the sidewalk, so they they were using more than the parking space. Ooh, the flower then, people? Yeah, they were. They had like they like put some of their displays. This was years well, ago, so based on my loose recollection, but like I'm pretty sure they they wanted to like have a display. They actually ended up resolving that absent our input. Yep. Yes, they did. So, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. It's really no. Specific it's just to the, the issue. The, the point okay. being, what those people were doing, according to the state law, yes. we had no authority to tell them they couldn't do it. I don't. I, I don't know if that's. I don't know that. I don't. I don't recall the exact specifics, so I can't. I couldn't say. I'm going to call Kevin Sweet. He's got a great memory. <laughs> I mean, so I guess well, go just a larger, maybe philosophical question from the board is to what extent do we want to preclude business competition? No, I, I don't think we want to preclude or, or inhibit business competition at all. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to see a flower truck parked across from a flower pot on Mother's Day either, you know, which is what was basically was going to happen, something along those lines. There may not be the exact dates, but. I mean, I don't want to, and I, I don't want either of these policies to um, inhibit one's ability to set up shop and um, make make money. I just, I just want it to be, you know, fair fair to the folks that are already here and establish businesses and everything else. That's all. Well, and again, but it gets to the same argument. Um, it's not competition per se. It's fairness issue where you know somebody comes in for a day. And that that day was Mother's Day by by happenstance, and for ninety dollars they can take away business from a business that is paying taxes and uh, contributing to our community every single day, various volunteer issues and whatever. And so, do we want to have allow that type of competition where our contributing businesses? Are getting hurt by somebody coming in and taking advantage of this policy. Well, so I feel like that's a very specific example with it being Mother's Day. I would also just to the tax piece. I understand the brick and mortar businesses are paying obviously significantly more in taxes um, than you know daily permit, but it's an entirely different business model. So I wouldn't expect that if you're coming in for a day and you're only selling one or two products, I would hope that you have a brick and mortar business and you have a hundred different products you're able to make more money in that day than a person who's only selling a couple products and therefore the associated fees are scaled accordingly. Um, that is, you know, the specific example of it being Mother's Day and flowers. I feel like this, this process, having it go to the police department or the board or whoever the authorizing body would be, would help get around some of those special circumstances. But broadly, a food truck is a very different business model than a brick and mortar, you know, restaurant. And so, I don't know that we would want to try to hold them to the same standard when it comes to things like taxes. At least I, I mean, the, the concern from the, the concern from the restaurant owners we had that night was that this particular food truck was going to, has had established their days and times, and they were you know parked right across the street from Gigi's and five doors down from the main pizza bar, and they were here, and and others had concerns about. You know, setting up a schedule such as that at that time, and then actually someone that didn't even have a food business was concerned because they were taking up full parking spaces on their, you know, across the street from their business, and, and that's where 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 do their customers park? There's three or four businesses across the street from where that was that were, you know, concerned about the number of parking spaces. But that's so that's where that what the genesis of the complaint was, but. It's definitely a different business model, but when a guy says, I'm going to be here every Tuesday and Friday, that's that's 
not fair to um, you know the regular businesses that are there seven days, six days a week. But it's I don't know. I guess I can see the point there, but I mean, if I was selling, selling the same kind of food, they didn't park across from yeah. Chinese and sell Vietnamese food. It's totally different food. It's I, I don't personally I don't think it affects Gigi's that much, but if I'm the main ad, you know, the pizza bar or, or I'm the guy at the um the Italian the family deli and I sold, you know, 25 Fridays in a in a row, I sold 250 sandwiches and she sold 250 sandwiches and a hundred pizzas, the taco truck shows up mid Friday at lunchtime for three weeks in a row and my business is off 10%. And I don't know the numbers, but that's that's what the implication was, what you know the fear was. And the, and the implications were that those type of things would happen. And, you know, at least the gentleman from um, the family deli said that he's had that exact experience in other places. And that was what his major concern was. Was that sum that up? Yeah, that's right. That was his concern. He also had concerns about yeah. hygiene for the town, you know, cleaning up. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not. A lot of peripheral issues, but that was the main argument, was that he lost business specifically on the dates that they came in. He's paying rent, he's paying overhead costs, and he's doing everything else. And the people with, with the food truck are coming in and uh, with very little overhead. And, uh, taking away his business. Yeah, there are some slight embellishments, but that's the basic story. I mean, full disclosure, I eat at the taco truck. I also eat at Family Bell at pretty much the same frequency before food truck and after the food truck. Um, and I think a lot of the, the issues that come before, you know, when we talk about individual cases, these are things that can easily be solved by, hey, would you mind, you know, not parking the that you pick up in front of here, take up a little bit less space or move four spaces ahead? The food truck owners are very reasonable. I mean No, it's there's no question. They they you know, but they I think the other part of that concern too is we're sitting here talking about it kind of come back a little bit is that the the concern would be that in some places where it is or was unregulated, they saw kind of a a, a growing uh, food truck community and that affected business, not necessarily singling out the taco truck, but they were concerned that we were going to have, you know, what if we have four or five taco trucks on Main Street? What then what? And then then that becomes, I think the concern was that that was what was going to happen. More than one guy selling tacos. And honestly, if that did happen, you know, you know it's, it, it's in your, it's well within your purview and it's like what to be like, well, now we have an issue that's you know public right of way and making sure things are well organized and you can't have that or not. You know. I think some towns have uh like two truck limit in yeah. a given area. He said Hudson does too. Steve said Hudson does too. Okay. Did ADC look at this one as well? You guys have input in this? They did not. This no. came right. off so, last week. Uh, so what well, I mean we'll, you know, we'll just it makes sense that we do them both at the same time and bring them back together. My my opinion of the high group is we can just reduce all of the MPL points. If you ever want to stick down to the single line that says refer to NGL, and then seven is the real add ons for Maynard. Um, and for those add ons, frankly, I don't even the issue came to us on this one, so I would be okay uh, delegating this authority to the kind of administrator or somewhere along those lines. So that's okay too. Yeah. It seems it seems like it, it almost seems like it's just going to be a special permit, special use type of thing. Greg and Greg could probably handle that. We love scheduling events, but, but do we need to? But but we still need we still need to um, make the changes that Jeff suggested, and then come back when we come back with the other and vote on it. And then you know you guys can be the you guys can be the uh, uh, licensing authority per se, and we'll just vote to put it in play. Right. Was that right for now? both? Was that for what? both the peddlers, or was that? Was that for both the peddlers and hawkers? Yes, and no, 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 no. I think just just the hawkers and peddlers. Okay. And then okay. we'll 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 keep the um, we'll keep the food thing uh something yep. that will go through here on a regular on a, you know regular basis when it occurs. One thing no I would so we at least have included in the hawkers, unless I missed it, was um, 
who has the authority to shut them down if they're out there without a license? Okay, they're without a license. We have a $250 fee, but somebody must have authority to be able to go out and say, get out of here. You're not allowed to be here. And it's not it's not indicated as to who has that authority. Is that the police department? Is that members of Board of Health? Is it the members of uh, Select Board? Is it, you know, who has the authority to tell them to go? For hawkers, peddlers, I would recommend that it be the police department. And then I I am the um, appealing authority generally for citations. So um, I would I would recommend that be the police department be the enforcer because generally it's and it doesn't safety. matter to me who, who we put in there, but I think we should put somebody in there as the uh, yep. as the authority. Yep. Similar similar to license uh, liquor license violations and everything else. You know how we have. Okay. Um, Kids lemonade stands are generally exempt for these, is that correct? But it's the question that comes up. Don't, like, don't ask questions you don't want answers to. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I saw a kids lemonade stand on Cambridge Street in Burlington the other day. That's 3A. Two kids selling lace, selling lemonade on Cambridge Street. I'm thinking to myself, where's the parents? It's wild. <laughs> I was thirsty, but I kept going. <laughs> All right. So um, the senior center um, community, we had a meeting last week. Um, most of the meeting was centered on um, the discussions about the um, RFI, um, a timeline that um, Jack McKeon had developed for, um, uh, have he, had he shared that with you, Greg Johnson? Jack's timeline. Um, a time. I I don't recall. So Jack had corresponded with me, um, either last week or the week before, and just to sort of you know kind of talk details about me releasing the RFI. And I got back to him saying like I as I'd already told the board in the meeting, I won't. I haven't started. I won't be able to get back to it until next week. Yeah, it was just a um, timeline about articles and you know dollars and cents and what what the uh a little bit of um what he or the board the committee thought the article would look like and and that type of stuff and that's just work in progress stuff i kind of suggested it has to go from here anyway but we'll see where it goes mm. and then um you know, that was really that was really most of the conversation there was some other conversation that took place about um the group has done a lot of visits to other communities senior centers throughout the area and um, there was just discussions about different aspects of those visits by the people that went on them and the in the the um subcommittee of that committee that's kind of taking care of the um you know the visit scheduling them and it's in attending them and everything and it was an, an interesting conversation um just about what are some of the other things that they see in other communities that might be good fits for maynard um and you know they just just moving forward they're moving forward with those type of things and looking at places and waiting to see what comes back from the um request for information from other other sources in towns there, there was three or four listed that was part of the conversation Mill and Main, um, uh, 129 Parker that, you know, the Maynard, Maynard Crossing and a couple others were listed as people that they would have sent the um, request for information to when the time came. And that was really it. Just, you know, onward and upward is a conversation. Uh, if I may add to that, Jack shared with me um, and I believe you must have shared it with, you, with the members of the committee. I don't know, but um, essentially, they he he has listed, and in, in the email he sent to me, he listed five specific uh, items as to where they're focusing in on their cost analysis. Um, one is a lease. What where that is, they don't know. But a five to seven year plan with lease that would include. Their proposal would include fit up costs, if any, for any lease space. As you know, when we spoke here with them, when they were here a couple of weeks ago, I expressed that. So he wanted to share with me that, that 
he was working on this, fit out costs, including incremental costs to furnish and equip any larger space, and uh, including seeking grants for these things, uh, or whether or not we need to execute as funds available, operating costs that might change uh, with a larger space. Um, he says that Amy is drafting a memo that will go along with this, including COA staffing that might be needed, a social worker if there's a necessary change, necessary otherwise within the town budget. Uh, increased use of volunteers is a, is a consideration. Some programs pay as you go, um, seeking grants for operating costs as well as any town budget issues that might come up. And then lastly, the feasibility study for a long-term project, um, which he's calling, they call it MACAL. Chris, are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah. Managed Community Active Living, I think is yep. what he said it was. Active Living Center. Active Living Center. I believe that's they not, I they don't want to use the term senior center. They want to call it a community active, Maynard Community Active Living Center which would include uh, some type of younger kids involvement. Um, and so they're looking for possible sources of revenue for their feasibility study, including an earmark or a grant or a possible uh, warrant article. And all of these things that this group is actively working on is all part of my point from earlier in the meeting when I discussed priorities. These people are a lot further along with their uh, in, investment in time and planning than we may be aware of. I know Chris is involved in the meetings uh, and they're planning on coming to us on the same date in October uh, to town meeting to seek this money. Um, at least that's their current plan from what we heard yeah. on Saturday. But Mike was with me when Jeff was talking with us at the farmer's market. Um, so, and then it becomes okay. You can't do everything, and what's more important? Yeah, the same discussion as we had earlier. Yeah. Can I ask one question? I, and I missed it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, the money that they want to ask for at the fall town meeting is to pay for the temporary lease space or a feasibility study. I think they're looking at in the fall, and I don't quote yeah. me on this because I'm not in their meetings. But my understanding is they're looking for the lease space number. Okay, so both, 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 both. They want both, and they um, that's why they're they're really insistent on getting that the you know Greg to get out that uh, request or what's it called for request information. for information right. RFI sooner rather than later so that they can be prepared for that yeah. meeting in six weeks. Um, and regarding the feasibility study, I know that they had. They had some money allocated a couple of years ago. It was like during that pre cap reallocation process for the purpose of a feasibility study. And then I, I feel like Kate Hogan also got them some money. For yeah, that's for the that's and for the that's different. That's for the analysis from, from UMass Boston or UMass. So that money was to pay UMass. That money was issue, for that, and, and that's still ongoing. Got it. Okay, that's for that's their different. long term vision. Okay, so this different. is just for the yeah. Space. If I misquoted that, Chris. Like, no, no, it's it's. They want both. They're looking for. They're looking to get both at, at that that you know at that meeting. Did you get a copy of them? Yeah, you did. So they were next to um. The Green Meadow School, so um, their last meeting was, ten days ago or so, week ago Monday, and it was a meeting that um. Covered a lot, actually, a lot of conversation, a lot of pictures of um, and blueprints, schematics of um, specifically the um, cafeteria, is what I believe what they were calling it, the gymnasium slash cafeteria, that whole area of the building, um, and, and it spoke about you know the lighting and diff all different types of lighting, a lot of different stuff, but. Um, a lot of the meeting was taken up by a conversation um, that related to reviews of the plans done by um, Nicholas Kane, Nick Kane, and then Ken Newhouser, and and um, you know what their expertise, you know their their 
other life expertise, their job expertise is put to use to um, question, not to say question, but just comment on a lot of the different things that they saw, um, request some changes, some alterations to different things. And the, um, you know, the project managers were you know, more than willing to um, look at all those things and make some changes. And actually some of them they had already made and we just kind of got a rundown of the whole things. And that was basically the, um, you know, basically the, um, the meeting in a nutshell, they, they continue to uh, move ahead, you know, with scheduling and getting uh, some of the work done that um, that they can do without site plan reviews and that type of stuff. And then actually the, um, I believe I signed a document the other day that suggests that uh, they're gonna go to the planning board pretty soon with site plan review, are they not, Greg? I think that's one of the next steps. Going I'm not to, sure, but it, I think they are getting close, yes. Yeah, they, I think they're very close. They're, they're going to start their site plan review with the planning board fairly soon. I think there's a meeting on Monday. I think July 8th, there's the next meeting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, next week. It's next week, and that's it. So that's the Green Meadow. The Green Meadow School Building Committee is moving forward with all that stuff. I, I would just like to acknowledge the work that Nick Kane and Ken now Newhouse have put into it. Many, many hours of work, which if it had been done professionally, would have been pretty expensive. So, uh, didn't underappreciate their contribution to, to this project. Thanks. Thank All right, on to our uh, correspondences. We have a couple of correspondence items this evening. I'd like to make a motion. Move to accept correspondences A through B as shown. To the second. Second. Anybody want to talk about ORS or Comcast? All right. All those in favor? Great. Uh, minutes. This minutes. One set of minutes to approve. Accept and approve. I'll move to accept and approve meeting minutes of June 4, 2024. I've shown and authorized use of digital signature to approve. Second. Anybody have any concerns about the meetings from the six, six four and six twenty eight meetings? All those in favor? All right. We next have we Mr. Johnson's report. That's me. Um, oh yeah. So um, I really appreciate Stephanie Duggan putting in the work to uh, updating the town administrator's report for the board for this evening. Um, so I'll steal her thunder. So she noted that uh, town, town offices will be closed on Thursday and Friday of this week in observation of the July 4th holiday. Hope everyone has a very safe and joyous Independence Day activities. Um, the Route 27 project, uh, as I refer to as Cat Cottage Front Door, it is um, coming along. So um, the last report that I'm stealing a thunder from Justin DeMarco is that um, it should be in well into the planning phase right now. And I'm looking forward to hearing what the construction schedule is gonna be. And then um, I thought it was uh, really um, impressive, the PowerPoint presentation put together um, regarding the solar uh, array that's on top of the high school and, and, you know, and the parking structure in front of the high school. Um, it's not done yet. There, as noted in the PowerPoint presentation, the, 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 switch flip event or whatever it's referred to has not yet happened. It looks like it's in its final stages of uh, reviews and ever source approvals, um, but I'm looking forward to that switch getting flipped on. Um, but it's also good reference point in thinking about the Green Meadow Elementary School. So um, we are still engaged with our long-term consultant, Beth Greenblatt with Beacon Integrated. I can't remember the name of her firm, but I think it's Beacon Integration LLC, but either way, um, she's been instrumental uh, in getting the high school solar project off the ground and on the roof and, and over the parking. It's wonderful. And so we look to her again to help us out engaging with select or otherwise, particularly with SOLECT, S-O-L-E-C-T, um, to see what they could do for us with the elementary school. So it's kind of exciting that we're, we're able to sort of leverage those relationships into our future buildings. And then lastly, I really appreciate um, Fire Chief Lawless putting together her, uh, diligently putting together her fire department's report. 
Um, the fire department, per usual, is very engaged with the community. That's the takeaways I had from her most recent report. In addition to all their emergency response, but they're very um, um, community um, integrated and community supporting. They, they even were recognized as such with a grant, as she noted. And then I also appreciate the responsiveness to the recent cooling center initiatives that they took. The fire station's a wonderful hub for all things emergencies, even if it's a cooling center, um, the fire station's there. And that's all I had, unless there was questions from the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the end, the end reports, I guess they're all, my, my only report is again to um, thank Lindsay for joining us and welcome her to our board and to thank the other members of the board for um, all your help in the last year and uh, for entrusting me with your chairmanship and I look forward to um, the upcoming year with Jeff's leadership and, and helping in that as much as we can. So that's my report and um, that's it for me. Um, Jeff. Um, nothing additional. Uh, welcome, Lindsay, and looking forward to uh, another successful year with everybody. All right, Lindsay. Yeah. I got a report. Now it's time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have anything exciting to report. All right. Just thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really, right. really interesting, as always. All right. Um, David. Yes. I um, wanted to remind the residents that Wednesday starts the community band performances downtown. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone's encouraged to uh, take an opportunity to go and see at least one, if not all, during their Wednesday performances over the summer. Uh, second, Greg, have you had any opportunity, probably not, given that you've been on vacation, to speak with the schools about the WABM uh, use of the live television that we talked about at our last meeting? And if not, can you put it on your radar no. to speak with them? I did. I mean, I did. I mentioned it to Brian Haas. And, um, and so... His reaction? I don't remember uh, exactly, but I, I'm also in contact with uh, Steve Valenti, who's the WABM director. So we'll, um, I, I don't, I don't think anyone's opposed to it. It's probably just a matter of logistics. So we just have to look into it. All right. And the last point is you shared with us, which I thought it was just today. So I don't know if, every, if my colleagues have had a chance to see it, but the League of Women Voters uh, document that came out relative to town meeting. Um, I really think that we as a board should speak with the town moderator, mm -hmm. um, possibly even ask him to join us at a meeting so we can talk about some of the issues that came up. Um, Maynard fell sort of towards the low end on the average over the last 20 years of attendance at town meeting. I think the average attendance of vote number of voters was 2.78, uh, which is dismal, but the, uh, some of the interesting things that um that I thought about, like for Acton, for example, their town meetings that last six and a half days and whatever, they may have um that's an exaggeration, but um they may I don't know how they count numbers, if it's individual attendees, if it's total attendance versus number of uh, voters, or I don't know how they do it, but it'd be interesting to see them. But our average was 2.78 or 2.78% uh, at attendance, with the highest attendance being 16.49, given the fact that we're talking about a 20-year history, I think it was actually 16 or 18-year history. Um, it was probably the 129 Parker Street that got us to the 16.49, and then the low was 1.94, less than 2% of our voters attending town meetings. Um, and the overall number of 2.78, in the area that the legal women voters was um, was reviewing, which was like five towns in our immediate area, uh, we were towards the low end. Uh, so we, you know, we need to encourage more involvement at town town meeting. One could say, oh, we do such a wonderful job that our voters trust us and they don't think they have a need to to attend, and so they just don't. Uh, I tend to think that's probably not true. That I'm I'm my concern immediately went through to people don't want to attend because they're afraid to attend because they we don't uh, give the floor that the right you know who knows but why aren't people attending and i think we should have that discussion not only among ourselves but with the moderator and possibly some type of a town forum to ask what can we do better what can we do uh, but anyway that's it mike 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so other than to also welcome Lindsay, thank you for being here and contributing. Um, and Dave, you, you, you stole my thunder on, on that. Uh, I think with the women's uh, league women voters, I, I agree. I think it, there's some questions raised there, uh, which I think we would do well to study, uh, not least in terms of how we communicate with the how we motivate people to get involved. And yeah, the number's low. It's, it's depressingly low, but also depressingly common. Uh, I don't think we're an outlier. In the most communities, but definitely worth a look at the to do that. All right. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Why don't you make a motion? I make a motion to adjourn the mm -hmm. meeting. Second. All in favor? The next meeting is July 16th. Everybody have a CPAP before the July? Yes. 